Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We have the honor today of having Dr. Michael Levy. Dr. Levy is the Chief of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the Radis Children's Hospital in San Diego, professor in the UC San Diego School of Medicine, and the director of the Surgical Epilepsy Team and Neurotrauma Team in Children's Hospital, Los Angeles. Today at the 2021 IWBNC, Dr. Levy is going to share his lecture, Pediatric Cerebrovascular Disease. Please type write your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them after the end of Dr. Levy's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Levy, and thank you. Microphones are all yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I very much appreciate the invitation to speak again this year, and uh, I'm going to really discuss our experience with vascular malformations in children, uh, specifically aneurysmal malformations. Uh, I'm a professor of neurosurgery at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, I'm the head of the Division of Pediatric Neurological Surgery uh, at UCSD and at Rady Children's Hospital, and I have nothing to disclose. So the, the primary considerations, uh, just given that this is a, a small part of pediatric neurological surgery, um, are, are numerous, but the, some of the most important are who should be performing these procedures. Uh, and it's a great question um, because uh, more and more uh, of us in pediatric neurosurgery are uh, sending these cases out to uh, the busier adult vascular neurosurgeons. Uh, and, and that is definitely a trend. Um, I have always kind of uh, opted to go the other way and uh, take care of all of my vascular patients that are pediatric uh, from start to finish. And I think there are certain advantages to that. Um, probably the most important considerations are pre and post operative management. Um, if you have access to a children's hospital or an adept children's facility, uh, then you're really meeting what I believe are the standards to take care of these patients. But, but there needs to be a definitive expertise in pediatrics, uh, just given the whole plethora of uh, other type of variables they present with that can make management more difficult. Um, there are also some questions that we still don't have answers to. Uh, what is the utility of interventional management in these kids? Uh, it's a good question. There's varying outcomes. Um, a number of papers have been published, but uh, I feel that we don't have a real good understanding because it's so novel that we don't have long-term follow-up. Uh, the disease processes are different in children, uh, as I will discuss, and uh, it's really hard to predict long-term outcome. Uh, in a child, but also uh, with the constraints of anticoagulation and other type of uh, medical management, uh, uh, which are requisite in the treatment of these kids. Uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, how should we follow on ruptured aneurysms uh, um, based upon location size? And uh, is this going to be a path that's similar to that in adults? Is it gonna be different? Uh, and it, it's a very good question that still has to be addressed. I'm going to start with some of the acute presentations in children because it really kind of exemplifies all of the problems that one can um, incur when they're managing children with ruptured uh, intracranial aneurysms. Some of the considerations in smaller kids, infants, neonates, um, are positioning and cranial stabilization. Uh, it can be difficult to place kids in, in uh, Mayfield head frames or pin headrests in general. There are modifications to that that can incorporate. Um, uh, kind of a, a head holder, a U-shaped head holder um, that can also help buttress the head so they won't slip. Um, but I think the utilization of uh, a head frame is, is really mandatory for the management of vascular disease. Um, I would rather err on having punctate um, injuries to the to calvarium uh, or even a small depressed fracture as opposed to having somebody slip out of the pins. And so we tend to um, utilize the um, Mayfield for all of our cases. It, it also adds a couple of components um, that are really essential. Uh, the type of retractor systems we use uh, are those that uh, require Mayfield. Uh, and it also allows us to uh, incorporate uh, frameless stereotaxy uh, into our surgical endeavor. So uh, I really believe that it's mandatory to use uh, uh, some kind of pin headrest or some kind of cranial stabilization. Uh, 
other concerns are uh, pre, intra, and post-operative angiography. Uh, what kind of studies can we get uh, based upon the uh, appropriate dye load uh, for these kids? How much radiation can they be exposed to? We uh, try to be less aggressive with children than with adults, but uh, intraoperative angiography is so vital uh, to everything that we're, we're doing surgically that uh, I think we reserve uh, a lot of um, the radiation load for intraoperative management of these patients. Very obvious uh, consideration is estimated blood loss. If you're dealing with a small person, uh, they can get into difficulty very quickly. So if you have an intraoperative rupture, that can be extraordinarily problematic. And as opposed to finding the bleeding point and establishing proximal control, um, like you would in an adult patient, uh, this can be much more problematic because then you're trying to keep up with the blood volume. Uh, and it's always good to stay ahead. I think it's wise to anticipate bleeding and try to your best to stay ahead. Any intervention in kids, whether it be surgical, uh, uh, or placing a ventricular catheter, or just the mere fact that they have a ruptured aneurysm, uh, whether it's uh, purely a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, or if there's an intracerebral component, uh, or a component that's extending into the ventricle, can be associated with hydrocephalus. Children are much more susceptible to the development of hydrocephalus than adults, and this needs to constantly be looked for. The um, concomitant uh, hydrocephalus can be very difficult uh, in the overall management of these kids because then you're dealing with two problems, uh, but it definitely needs to be managed and um, the long-term requirements of shunting, uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy and such uh, are problematic, but, but a necessity given that hydrocephalus uh, is, is a frequent problem uh, with ruptured aneurysms uh, in these age ranges. Things as simplistic as room temperature and uh, children developing a uh, kind of a coagulopathic uh, presentation given blood loss uh, and a low temperature in the OR uh, are things that need to be remembered. And, and one of the reasons that I uh, reaffirm the necessity of these procedures taking place in to, I guess, a pediatric friendly hospital uh, with pediatric intensivists, pediatric nursing, uh, OR staff that's used to taking care of pediatrics, but most importantly, pediatric anesthesia. The last consideration is vasospasm. Children do develop vasospasm. Uh, and what mechanisms do we utilize to treat vasospasm? Uh, do we treat vasospasm as we would with an adult? Uh, whereas protocols can differ based upon uh, the medical center you're at. Um, how long do you treat these kids for? Uh, many of the same concerns we have with adults, but just a very different clinical picture. So this is a six month old child who presented with an acute bleed. Uh, an intraparenchymal hemorrhage combined with a subdural component, a subarachnoid component. You see some low density here and you see a great degree of shift already present in this patient. On the imaging studies, we see what we believe was a middle cerebral distribution aneurysm that was responsible for the bleed. This is a limited angiogram um, that gives some sense of the aneurysm, you can see the vessels are bowed out uh, just from the large clot uh, and the extensive mass effect. Uh, and basically this patient underwent a surgical intervention. Uh, once again, this is a six month old, so 25 to 30 cc's of blood loss can be extraordinarily problematic. Uh, you have to work your way through a clot. You have to make sure the brain is soft enough to get to the aneurysm. Uh, and in this case, we are able to trap and excise the aneurysm. This is a second case of a similar, similar type of case with a posterior cerebral distribution uh, aneurysm with an associated clot. And then this is a child that had a bifurcation aneurysm with a posterior bleed into the ventricular system uh, with really a minimal subarachnoid component, but mainly an interventricular component. And this is post-op. Uh, where the aneurysm was successfully clipped. The child, child developed uh, aggressive swelling following the clip uh, placement uh, in the intensive care unit, went back for a decompressive craniectomy, uh, and additionally developed hydrocephalus and subsequently had placement uh, uh, or replacement of the calvarial vault uh, with a model. Uh, you see there's a shunt placed here. Uh, 
uh, and basically here's the replace Calvary vault and here's the shunt in place. This is another child that presented uh, additionally with a posterior circulation uh, uh, PCA distribution aneurysm associated with both an interparenchymal component and an interventricular component. And this is post-treatment. There you can see the clip superimposed. Um, we were unable to really adequately decompress the ventricular system of blood, um, something that uh, we attempt to do, but was quite difficult uh, given that this child, child's brain was quite swollen. Uh, and so uh, we were able to irrigate out some of the interventricular component of the blood, uh, but really didn't have a chance to uh, remove as much as we thought would be appropriate. This is a seven month old that presented with the anterior um, distribution, probably an A2 distribution aneurysm uh, with a large frontal clot and some displacement across the midline. And this is post-operative images. Uh, in this case, we actually excised the aneurysm uh, with the clot. Uh, and you see here on this post-operative image that most of the A2s remain intact. This is another 17 month old. Uh, and the difficulty with this is this was believed to be a left middle cerebral distribution aneurysm, uh, but it can be extraordinarily difficult to really discern where the aneurysm is uh, in some of these children, especially the ones with larger clots. Uh, another difficulty is, um, is the consideration of immediately going to surgery for clot decompression uh, based upon the stability of the child, uh, or do we actually try to get an angiogram my preference is to try to get an emergent angiogram because that information is essentially vital, uh, in my opinion, uh, but sometimes we don't have uh, that choice. Um, somehow a ventricular catheter was placed into the clot in this 17-month-old, uh, uh, but there are many characteristics of these kids that are difficult. This um, uh, child still had a remnant of the fontanelle. Uh, you can see that uh, there's no pneumatization of the sphenoid. Uh, so there's, there's a, just numerous problems you encompass with the younger child um, that obviously you won't see in an adult. This is post-operative imaging. You could see there was a secondary uh, expansion, dilatation of the ventricular system into an area of injured brain. Uh, and this is a lateral film post-operatively. This is a nine-month-old that presented with a bleed, uh, really a subdural bleed, a minimal subarachnoid component with a multilobulated uh, kind of frontal peripheral aneurysm, if you will. Uh, and this was basically approached and excised, but uh, once again, a very young child, wide open fontanelle. And basically you can see um, that the um, aneurysm was clip trapped and excised. This is another 14 month old, uh, had a aggressive subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, these are, are basically <laughs> just a suggestion that uh, in, in younger children, you know, how significant these surgeries can be. Um, children can also manifest all of the problems that you will see in adults. Uh, in this case, the child had post-operative uh, swelling, developed a pseudomeningocele, uh, the flap had to be removed. Uh, but all of the problems that we see in adults are also potentially manifest in a child uh, and can be extraordinarily difficult to take care of. So looking at our series of infants and neonates, um, these are some of the approaches that looking back at, I, I think uh, uh, are useful to know and understand. This was a series of 24 patients. There were 16 males and eight females with a mean age of 12 months. The presentations uh, are really different uh, for the most part. Uh, then you see in adults, we had one patient that presented with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, six had cranial nerve findings, two with hydrocephalus, one with an intracerebral hemorrhage, one with developmental delay, uh, two presented with a steel phenomena, uh, two with just routine imaging studies. Uh, and overall, one was believed to be infectious in nature, two were presumptively traumatic, uh, though it's difficult to, to determine if the trauma uh, actually caused the aneurysm or if it resulted in an imaging study that allowed us to see it. Uh, 
uh, and 21 were felt to be spontaneous in nature. Uh, location, five at the ICA bifurcation, three were pericolosal, six middle cerebral, one basilar, three involving pica, four involving P2, um, one basically involving the posterior circulation, which was diffuse, uh, and then a diffuse bihemispheric uh, aneurysm, which uh, essentially took up uh, over 80% of the uh, uh, skull and uh, was not really felt to be feasible for any type of treatment, uh, and this child was allowed to die. So 50% of our cases were basically involving uh, anterior circulation uh, and 37% the posterior circulation. Uh, 10 of 24 of our patients had uh, what were construed to be giant aneurysms, uh, representing 42%. Uh, this is a large bifurcation aneurysm that bled posteriorly into the ventricle. You can see the ventricular blood. Uh, and as I showed you before, following a, a clip placement, the patient had aggressive swelling, uh, needed to have uh, uh, a decompressive craniectomy uh, within a bolt replacement uh, with a manufactured uh, implant uh, and had uh, associated hydrocephalus. Um, this was a patient with a multilobulated aneurysm uh, that required uh, basically a, a clip reconstruction. Um, this was uh, a neonate uh, with a large um, bifurcation type aneurysm uh, that also underwent a clip reconstruction. Uh, and that child actually required uh, an additional uh, cardiac bypass during surgery. So I think the important considerations are once again, this isn't adult disease. And that's not to say that technically speaking that everything that's done uh, surgically uh, is not very much the same in adults and children. Uh, there are just other issues that can become problematic um, that if you don't do a lot of kids, and it's hard for anybody to do a lot of kids, uh, then it really can uh, create a bad outcome. A lot of the middle uh, cerebral distribution uh, and even distal bifurcation type of aneurysms we see uh, are associated with basically uh, diseased walls, um, not necessarily secondary to infection, but the wall itself is, um, is paper thin uh, and with really manipulation at the time of surgery uh, will bleed quite aggressively. And um, this is something that is extremely worrisome during your initial encounters, but uh, something you anticipate subsequently and um, usually is dealt with with a sunt uh, clip um, in my hands. Uh, which uh, really seems that it's very well suited uh, for the treatment of these cases. Um, interventional methodologies are difficult because you can't tell uh, what the extent of the disease vessel is. Uh, and so if you actually um, do a pipeline or you bypass it uh, using interventional techniques, uh, is the distal uh, aspect of your uh, pipeline uh, extend beyond the disease segment. We've had a case where that wasn't uh, in fact true uh, and the child uh, had a re-bleed uh, just distal uh, to the pipeline. So the path the physiology differs. Uh, it, it's really pretty obvious in the younger kids that all of these are developing in utero or a majority are developing in utero, uh, but also because they're congenital lesions, it also changes some of the considerations and approach. Um, Perforators tend not to be present in some aneurysms in areas where you expect there to be perforators. Uh, these uh, middle cerebral segment aneurysms um, that appear to be fusiform uh, a lot of times can be addressed and, and where you would expect the normal lenticular stride perforators to be, they're just not there. Uh, and so this allows uh, some degrees of freedom with dealing with some of the giant aneurysms where you can actually uh, whether it be by clip ligation or excision, uh, you could remove the aneurysm from the circulation and not get a secondary infarct from also including perforators, uh, whether it be in your clip uh, construct uh, or in the removal of the aneurysm itself. Um, we've attempted bypasses uh, in a number of children. Uh, my series, there's a total of eight patients who were bypassed and 50% um, of those remain patent. 
uh, in the kids where the bypasses did not remain patent, uh, we had no negative outcomes. So I, I think this is once again, a reminder that uh, uh, there is some freedom uh, with how aggressive you can be in children uh, in really doing things that wouldn't make sense in the adult population because you're dealing with a congenital lesion, uh, a lesion that forms in utero and something that is very, very different than something that develops over the long term as we see in adults. Uh, there's really no good nomenclature for a lot of these lesions. Uh, dural fistula is a, a frequent term that's utilized, but, but uh, I prefer the term aneurysmal malformations because you're dealing with a lot of giant aneurysms um, that are basically a dilatation with uh, aggressive arterial um, input into the lesion. Uh, thin-walled uh, venous output, um, but usually a single uh, vessel going into it, a dilatation, a single vessel leaving it, uh, and really worrisome uh, issues with uh, moving the aneurysm improperly because it's very easy to tear that thin segment that's exiting uh, or the venous component. Uh, but the pressure is very notable. Uh, you have large pulsatile vessels <coughs> feeding some of these aneurysms. And, and so a lot of your management strategies have to do completely with approach, uh, a big enough approach to allow for good visualization of everything that's important, uh, but also limiting it just given the blood loss associated with a, an approach like this in a child. And once again, if you're dealing with a giant aneurysm in a child, uh, rupture is not something that can occur because neonates and infants can die very quickly from blood loss when that occurs. So this was a case uh, back in 1993 uh, of a lesion. This is an intraoperative image. Um, and then this was a, a three-dimensional stereolithographic model uh, that we completed. And uh, this essentially was our first attempt at doing this. Unlike today, uh, this model took about two weeks to make. And uh, <clears throat> we learned the hard way that the media had to be a powder-like media because in liquid, uh, parts that were in different dimensions uh, would float down to the bottom of the media. Uh, so powder was what worked for us at that time. Things have obviously gotten a lot better and I'm gonna discuss some of the three-dimensional models we're now making. So overall in our patient population <clears throat> of these younger children, <clears throat> excuse me, we've had five cases that were uh, undergoing endovascular treatment, uh, whether it be coil and embolization alone uh, or an embolization resection. Um, nine patients had uh, basically a trapping of the aneurysm. Eight underwent a trap excision. Uh, and then one underwent a trap excision and bypass, which was a pica pica bypass. Uh, and then nine went uh, some variant of clip ligation, uh, two with clip ligation, a cardiac arrest, uh, two with a uh, clipping and wrapping of the aneurysm, uh, and then five standard clip ligation, uh, as you would normally expect. And then there was the one patient, once again, that we did not treat based upon uh, the size of the aneurysm and really uh, the inability to do anything that would uh, be of any use to the child. In these cases, uh, seven were modeled, and these are stereolithographic models and virtual models. Uh, and uh, we've really found a contribution of both to um, really our ability to get good outcomes in these kids. So outcomes in those patients underwent clip ligation. Um, the negative outcomes is one rebled and died, and that was a P2 aneurysm. One had a transient paresis uh, associated with an intraoperative rupture, and this was an ICA bifurcation aneurysm that underwent a clip uh, wrap uh, for treatment. Of those that were trapped, six patients were intact. Uh, two were intact uh, with baseline paresis. Uh, one required an M1 excision, as I was discussing earlier, and one remained intact at their baseline, uh, but had a post-operative intracerebral hemorrhage uh, following an excision at the uh, M1, M2 segment. Uh, of those that were treated endovascularly, two were intact. Uh, two died from rebleeds, one at the M1 segment, one was Basler, um, and then one patient had uh, a stroke uh, following a clip ligation um, or no, following the endovascular treatment. Uh, and then once again, the one patient died with no treatment. Uh, 
So for clip ligation, we had 11% morbidity and mortality. Uh, for trapping, no morbidity, no mortality. Uh, and uh, in our early experience with the younger children, 20% morbidity and 40% mortality uh, for endovascular treatment. So this reaffirms that some of the giant and more difficult aneurysm trapping uh, really is a, a viable uh, way to proceed, um, despite the fact that that may not be true in adult populations. So if you look at seven cases of preoperative virtual modeling, uh, most involved M12 segments, A1 fistula, A1 segment, a pica segment, and vertebral artery aneurysm. And all these patients were intact following surgery. There's no way you can correlate that these seven patients where we had modeling uh, really benefited uh, from the models themselves. Uh, but what you can say is that you're much better prepared for the surgery. And I think it did make a, a big difference in minimizing some of your intraoperative uh, complications. Um, there's no doubt that it increases your anatomic recognition. Uh, I think it decreases the time until you obtain proximal control. Uh, and it also decreases your surgical duration, which is vitally important in a child. So the primary issue, once again, is blood volume. Uh, what is the estimate of blood loss? Uh, what is sustainable loss? Should you transfuse uh, at the time of incision uh, or should you hold off? Um, we usually will transfuse at the time of incision with uh, these smaller children. The importance of time uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, long, prolonged surgeries are associated with longer uh, periods of time for children to cool down, uh, more difficult to warm them up, uh, chronic oozing from the bone, uh, and parenchyma, uh, and all of these things can lead to uh, more aggressive blood loss and potential coagulopathy. Structurally, uh, the scalp is extremely vascular in a child. Uh, the pericranium is vascular, so when we incise the pericranium, we actually leave it intact and attached to the, the skull. Uh, the bone is vascular, and aggressive use of bone wax uh, is really a necessity, uh, and then dural lakes are not infrequent. So just getting to the pathology can be met with aggressive blood loss. And, and this is a significant problem. Uh, for a lot of these kids, 45 cc's is an absolute cutoff uh, and things can go horribly wrong uh, if you get to that point. Uh, this was our child uh, adolescent series of 17 complex cases. Uh, and overall, uh, in general, the treatment and the etiologies are different, and that's the point of this slide. Uh, locations were not that much different. The complications, uh, three had vasospasm, two had a graft occlusion, one had a clip that actually slipped and required a reoperation, and two uh, had infection. Uh, there were no mortalities. Uh, five had no change in their uh, pre- versus post-operative exams. Five had deficits, and seven had good outcomes. Uh, so very similar outcomes as we're seeing with our infants and neonates but a very different population. These are some of the models we're constructing now. Uh, and for every vascular case, uh, we create models which really contribute significantly to our understanding of the pathology, but also our approach. Uh, this is a patient with a large uh, anterior uh, circulation-based AVM. Uh, this is a giant aneurysm in a child. Uh, this is another AVM associated with the dural malformation. Uh, this is allowing us to follow an aneurysm uh, that's fusiform in nature. Uh, and then this is a child that had a pigtail uh, middle cerebral segment, and this green uh, appendage here is a developing aneurysm that we're following using stereolithographic models uh, inter, uh, in addition to uh, standard angiography. Um, virtual approaches uh, are also well described at this point, and essentially uh, you get your imaging. This is then converted into obviously your two-dimensional model. This is converted to a three-dimensional virtual model. Uh, and then you utilize this, whether it be through a head-mounted display, uh, through integration with your stereotactic system, brain lab or otherwise, uh, and then correlating your stereotactic system with your microscope. Uh, and these are all things that we do concurrently to treat our kids uh, uh, with vascular malformations. Uh, and there's a number of things that are very, very positive about this. And, and once again, uh, increasing your anatomic knowledge uh, 
uh, especially for some of these more complex uh, and abnormal malformations, uh, really diminishes your operative time. It enhances your awareness. Uh, it establishes multiple views that you can never get surgically. Uh, and both your solid and virtual models allow for this. Uh, it allows you to rotate and interact to see behind the pathology. You can make the vessels transparent. Uh, and it really overall just improves your visualization. And, and I'm a big fan of these uh, technologies because I think they make a difference. This was a large vertebral segment, giant aneurysm. Uh, I believe this child was two weeks old. This was a, uh, a solid model that was made. Uh, they basically helped us uh, have a good understanding of the approach to take. Um, you can't really make a, a small approach and roll the dome uh, because that can shear the venous component, uh, which is thin walled. Uh, so what you need is an approach that will get you directly uh, both to the feeding vessel uh, and the draining vessel. Uh, this is the post-operative imaging. Uh, this actually was useful in what we didn't see. Uh, this was a thrombosed MC uh, a aneurysm uh, and basically the reconstruction of all the salient surrounding anatomy gave us a very good understanding of what we would see during the approach uh, and allowed for uh, a successful surgery in this child. This was an MCA bifurcation segment aneurysm. That's the three-dimensional model. Uh, and then this is basically the virtual model. And you can see um, basically different views, different approaches, a different understanding of angles, uh, all of which can, can make these uh, surgeries uh, proceed much more easily. Um, all of these three-dimensional reconstructions uh, uh, were really made for us by surgical theater. Uh, I don't even own um, the surgical theater um, set up uh, at my hospital, but these were all uh, basically donated uh, uh, and performed on uh, my complex cases and, and all of which really improved our outcomes. And these, uh, as you've seen before, uh, are just good ways to uh, mimic your surgical approach, get a good sense of where the neck is, what the anatomy is, what's behind the anatomy, uh, really making use of a walk around um, that you can't just do otherwise. You can do the same with a, with a solid model, and I'm very fond of solid models. Um, almost find them to be a little bit more helpful, um, but that's not always the case. And this is that same case um, intraoperatively uh, and allows for a smaller exposure uh, using the Ichiban dissector. Uh, really rapidly, we're able to identify and isolate the neck. And then uh, with the single clip placement, able to basically cure this disease in this child. This is 35 month old with the thrombosed MCA aneurysm. So you can see a large partially thrombosed uh, aneurysm. This was the reconstruction on the imaging. And then this is the 3D reconstruction to allow us to get a good sense of how we will approach it, uh, what we'll see during our approach. Um, and, and just once again, the anatomy that's salient uh, and a path that we're gonna take to uh, successfully treating this. This was treated with uh, an excision uh, and had no complications postoperatively. This was a fistula with a steel. Um, really doesn't fit as uh, an aneurysm, obviously. Uh, but once again, this is arterialized high pressure blood uh, that's leading to a steel phenomena, uh, which was the reason that uh, prompted us to do an excision. And this was basically a clip ligation with excision. And then this is the virtual model for this child. 
you can see that the vessels um, are no longer opacified. It allows you to see through the vessels. There are a number of things that you can do to just get a better understanding of uh, not only the surrounding vessels, but the course of surrounding vessels, uh, the course of perforators. Um, all these things are really vital to getting a good understanding of what you're going to encounter. Uh, this was a 10 day old with a giant aneurysm malformation. Uh, and once again, I, I don't think dural fistula is an appropriate term for this. Uh, this is high pressure, arterialized blood uh, feeding the lesion. Uh, the lesion's pulsatile. Uh, the vessel leaving it uh, is either arterialized uh, or arterialized uh, venous structure. Um, but these are difficult lesions. Uh, if this ruptures, there are no other options. And so preparation is the uh, most important consideration. This is an intraoperative uh, film of the dome. Uh, this is after uh, the lesion was trapped. Uh, we're taking out the thrombus uh, and then we excise the lesion. And then this is the three-dimensional modeling for this case. But it really gives you a very good sense of the circuitous course of vessels around the inferior aspect of the dome. Uh, this was actually uh, the draining vessel. You can see the large feeding vessel. Uh, and once again, if you see the draining vessel, you can understand why rotating the lesion is not a good idea. But this really allowed uh, for enough salient information that uh, we could minimize our craniotomy uh, and we could really successfully excise this. Uh, with no compromise to the child, with no blood loss, uh, and a very successful outcome. Uh, this was another aneurysm that we did a 3D reconstruction on. Uh, this was a bilobed uh, a middle cerebral distribution aneurysm. Uh, these are one of the vessels and, and abnormalities I was telling you were the whole segments diseased. Uh, and the problem with this uh, is this not only are the aneurysms problematic, but this fusiform component uh, and the entirety of all of this is diseased. Um, the problematic options are clip ligation is probably enough. Clip ligation with reconstruction uh, of this wall, surgically speaking, uh, is probably the next best choice. Um, interventional uh, modalities, at least in this specific case, did not uh, work, and this child had a distal rupture uh, and died following uh, the interventional procedure. Uh, this model was once again created because we were initially anticipating uh, a surgical approach, and that surgical approach would have been a clip occlusion of the aneurysms uh, and then a reinforcement of the uh, fusiform uh, segment that was distal to that. So just in regard to modeling, I think our preoperative uh, anatomic modeling resulted in rapid isolation and ligation of proximal feeders uh, in one five and 30 month old infants, uh, rapid single attempt clip placement in one 30 month old, verification of a congenital absence of, lum of uh, lenticular stride perforators um, and trapping excision, which was successful in a 16 month old, uh, trapping excision with a pica pica bypass in a 36 month old, uh, trapping excision uh, in the vertebral distribution giant malformation in a 21 month old. And once again, in these seven cases, uh, there were no morbidities or mortalities. Uh, but once again, taking that step and saying that uh, A resulted in B is, uh, is difficult. Uh, you can't really obviously say that, but there's no doubt that the uh, understanding of the anatomy, the understanding of what potential approaches can be taken um, and the utilization of both virtual and solid models uh, was a significant help uh, in all of these cases. Uh, in conclusion, managing infants and neonates with uh, uh, cerebrovascular disease, most notably aneurysmal type malformations can be extraordinarily difficult. Um, I think those people that feel comfortable with these are those that should be doing the surgeries, whether they be adult neurosurgeons or pediatric neurosurgeons. I think that having um, the full support of uh, pediatric anesthesia, pediatric intensivists, and a children's hospital is extremely vital to, to being successful in these cases because uh, 
uh, hopefully, as I pointed out, these children can do quite uh, well. The integration of technology and the management of these kids is, is also very important given that the die load uh, allowing for successful angiography, um, the lack of understanding of uh, uh, the good and bad for endovascular approaches, uh, all of these things kind of uh, make it more difficult uh, for uh, X-ray based imaging, if you will, uh, to be uh, the only thing you depend on. Uh, so reconstruction of whether it be 3D CT or 3D MRI scans uh, has really made a big difference uh, uh, in how we manage these kids. I um, hope that this has been somewhat informative given this is a strange subset uh, of children, but uh, it's something that people do see in their practice that people do have some specialization in uh, and just technically uh, those things that we use to approach and manage these younger uh, children uh, obviously can be uh, utilized in the treatment of adults uh, or teenagers. And uh, I think uh, the knowledge is helpful in dealing with any population of uh, patient that has a complex vascular malformation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture, Thank you, Dr. Levy. Levy. Thank you very much. So I'm sure all the audience has learned from your robust experience. Um, right now, we have a few questions from the public. So um, Dr. Madrinian is asking um, a question in, uh, regarding the uh, role of radio surgery. And um, is there a role for radio surgery in any vascular relations in children? It, not in kids this age. Uh, so I'm thinking of kids that are basically one month to 36 months of age. Um, we try to avoid as much radiation as possible, whether it be for brain tumors, uh, uh, trying to diminish uh, the number of CTs we, we get. Uh, all children's hospitals significantly decrease the amount of radiation associated just with the standard CT. Um, and Angiography and intraoperative angiography, I think, is uh, extraordinarily important. But in and of itself, this this delivers a huge uh, amount of radiation to um, a young child and a young brain. So at this point in my practice, uh, I do not uh, think of using radio surgery uh, for lesions in kids of this age. We uh, uh, do use radio surgery uh, for some vascular malformations in older children. Uh, for cavernous malformations, we're starting to do uh, robotic laser ablations, and we've had some success with that, um, especially for those that are, are more difficult to reach surgically. Uh, but for younger population of patients, uh, I don't use radio surgery. Okay, wonderful. Um, Dr. Sanchez is, is writing right now. Thank you, Dr. Levy. In your experience, what should be the step-by-step -step training on learning curve for residents to offer safe surgery in complex cases of pediatric aneurysms? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I don't know that there's any easy way. You need to be fortunate enough to, to be at a facility where uh, they see a large number of vascular cases, um, uh, which will then trickle down obviously into a pediatric population. Um, it's different, um, say, with true AVMs, because uh, every adult with an AVM is a child that was missed, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but some of the congenital aneurysms in children uh, at some point uh, will present themselves uh, and be problematic. Uh, population being at a center that uh, uh, has a large catchment area, uh, having relationships with hospitals uh, in other countries, uh, where uh, you can see some of these more complex cases that will be sent to your institution. Um, that's really been um, why we've been so lucky in seeing a large number of these cases. It's um, not uh, anything really other than that. Uh, I think training uh, is important. Um, training primarily to be a vascular neurosurgeon. Um, if you can couple that with being a, a pediatric neurosurgeon, I think that's ideal. Uh, I was fortunate in that I was allowed to uh, be a vascular neurosurgeon uh, at our um, primary uh, hospital 
after I graduated from my fellowship uh, while also being a primary pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, so really was allowed to, to kind of proceed on both pathways. And so uh, I think that's why I feel uh, comfortable uh, doing this, but uh, it, it's all exposure uh, and uh, a good vascular experience is I think the most essential component. Coupling a good vascular experience with a good skull base experience, I think makes you even better. Um, and then uh, feeling comfortable with children, whether you are or are not a pediatric neurosurgeon uh, is the next step. But uh, I, I think an extraordinarily well-trained um, vascular neurosurgeon, as you're going to be hearing from uh, throughout these conferences, are all people that can do a spectacular job with these cases. Um, it's just some of the nuances uh, uh, that I prefer to keep these to uh, our own institution. Well, thank you for your answer. Um, Julian Andraus is asking um, or writing, thank you, Dr. Levy, for such an amazing lecture. Due to the fact that, that there is not a sufficient volume of evidence that guides the management of SAH in pediatric population, which are your considerations regarding the timing and optimal neurosurgical management for this disease? That's a great question. The, the easy ones are obviously those that are uh, associated with some acute phenomena, uh, which is a bleed. So um, that makes it much simpler when uh, you have somebody that's presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage or an intracerebral hemorrhage or subdural hemorrhage, as we saw in that one patient. Um, an aneurysm that is getting larger on serial imaging uh, is also something that uh, we will treat uh, depending on the etiology uh, and if the child is syndromic uh, and if there's reason to believe that it's vessel disease, wall disease, uh, we'll treat those patients. Uh, most of the aneurysms we see, we follow uh, because these are picked up from somebody falling off of a skateboard or having a headache or having something completely unrelated that gets an image where you see an aneurysm. We also see a lot of complex aberrant uh, vessel distributions. Uh, the problems we have are with kind of the circuitous vessels or the pigtailing vessels that on certain cuts will look like an aneurysm when it isn't in fact such. Uh, and that's where the 3D reconstructions are very helpful. But, but I agree, I, I think it's uh, unfortunately a, uh, a developing understanding of how to follow these, these kids. Um, so I manage it much as I would uh, an adult, which is if there's an acute event uh, or evidence um, based upon etiology that this is gonna get bigger, uh, a steel phenomena uh, or, or something that really pushes you to operate. Uh, but the mere presence of an aneurysm unruptured um, isn't necessarily going to be the indication to operate, especially in infants and neonates where the surgical endeavor can be associated with mortality. Uh, so I have the advantage of following these kids usually for 18, 20 years. Um, so uh, we can get a long-term follow-up and a long-term understanding of what uh, the aneurysm is doing and whether it's doing anything or not. But in those cases, we actually make it have to do something uh, that necessitates surgery before we act. Okay, perfect. Um, Dr. Francisco Perez is asking, thank you doctor for your lecture. In which cases did you prefer endovascular over open surgery? Uh, we're still learning. Um, we had two very bad outcomes uh, with two uh, endovascular procedures in very young kids, uh, and then had uh, most recently uh, a large uh, cavernous pericavernous aneurysm um, that uh, was treated uh, with dual pipelines uh, and coil placement, I believe, and the patient had a spectacular outcome. Um, I'm willing to move in the direction uh, of doing more endo endovascular uh, work in these kids and, and for blue embolizations, things like that. Uh, it's a little, uh, it's an easier decision to make. Uh, but for some of these complex lesions where you're certain that uh, there's disease uh, impacting the vessel wall, uh, I'm still very, very hesitant uh, uh, to proceed with an endovascular uh, route, if you will. And we have an incredible endovascular team here uh, at UCSD with a great deal of experience with pediatrics. Uh, and, and basically are all 
learning together as to you know what's really the best approach. Um, I think uh, for the obvious things, Basler tip aneurysms, uh, uh, some of these other uh, uh, things that are well defined uh, in the adult population, those are all treated with endovascular management. It's really kind of the complex lesions in younger kids that I don't know what the answer to that is. Okay, doctor, wonderful. Um, the next question is uh, about the localization of intracranial aneurysms. Um, Dr. Madarinian is asking, which is the most frequent leash location uh, excuse me, for saccular intracranial aneurysms? Uh, it's, it's difficult because what we're seeing is a little bit different than, than what's been published. But once again, these are in extraordinarily young kids. Uh, and we're seeing a pretty even distribution between uh, anterior circulation and posterior circulation aneurysms. Um, in the older kids, we're heading into adolescents and teenagers, we're seeing a lot of bifurcation aneurysms uh, uh, and fewer uh, aneurysms involving the poster circulation. What we do see in the poster circulation aneurysms in the younger kids is they tend to be giant in nature. Uh, so they tend to be more difficult to manage. Uh, we've had a couple of giant aneurysms like the one I had showed you uh, in the one 10 day old child. Uh, but we're getting much more of an even distribution than I would have imagined to be many years ago. Uh, I've always been under the assumption that we're going to see more in the way of giant aneurysms, posterior circulation aneurysms. And we are seeing an increased percentage of giant aneurysms, uh, but it's not a, a significant difference between posterior circulation uh, and anterior circulation for the distribution of these. Okay. Um, we've got a similar uh, uh, question here uh, about well, the annual rate of bleeding. And um, what is the annual rate of bleeding for saccular intracranial aneurysms in children? I don't know. Uh, and I don't think that anybody knows. We use uh, the adult statistics. Uh, and so we kind of, that's what we have. And, and we try to utilize that. But the, uh, the truth is we don't know because the mechanism is very different. You're dealing with the congenital aneurysm that once again is something that develops in utero. You're not dealing with hypertension. You're not dealing with uh, hardened atherosclerotic vessels. Uh, you're dealing with an entirely different beast. And um, I'm really uncertain as to why some of these rupture as opposed to not. Um, we'll operate on cases with a very big bleed, get in there and have a, a very thick walled dome of an aneurysm that ruptured. Uh, where then we'll operate on thin walled lesions that are getting big, bigger that don't rupture. Um, I think the most worrisome cases are those, once again, where you have a disease segment of vessel where the aneurysm is, is kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, that's more of a warning sign that something's going on as opposed to being the primary problem. So if you just address the aneurysm in those cases, you're missing the issue. And, and I think those patients are going to bleed, but, um, this is what I, I tell families is we really don't know uh, for aneurysms what the uh, chance of rebleed is. Uh, it's even hard to say what the potential for bleeding based upon size of the aneurysm is and location. Uh, and it's because you're dealing with a, a very, very different beast in kids. Uh, congenital aneurysms just look and behave differently at times. Okay. Um the next question was uh, written by Dr. Torres on this. What did you consider is the role of neurophysiological monitoring during vascular surgery in children? Uh, we monitor everybody. The problem is in the younger kids, getting, getting any kind of signal can be virtually impossible. Uh, every child, no matter what age we have uh, in a pin headrest uh, with or without support, uh, all have uh, frameless stereotaxy to assist with our navigation and approach. Um, all have uh, three-dimensional models made of their anatomy to assist with our approach. Um, so I think all of these things are very important. All have intraoperative angiography. Um, so everything we would do with an adult and beyond, uh, we do with a child. Um, the monitoring is something we do in everybody, but there are some kids that are just so young that we're not getting any motor or sensory signal. Uh, and so it's, it's there, but it's not really useful. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Levy, the next question is um, a comparison between adult population. 
Uh, Dr. Peña is writing, what considerations should be taken into account when treating aneurysms in children compared to adults? And, and I, I don't understand the question, just as opposed to adults or? Yeah, well, maybe uh, what are the mm, different elements or the, well, the different things you take into account in order to do open surgery on children compared to adults? Um, pretty much the things I've been discussing, uh, the, the great thing about recognition of anatomy based upon your preoperative planning is you can do something quickly, uh, diminishing your uh, size of your craniotomy, just because the mo more bone that's exposed, the more oozing that you're going to get, uh, not stripping the pericranium from the bone, uh, because that's going to create a, a decent amount of oozing. Uh, and the longer these kids are in surgery, uh, there's going to be oozing that really is hard to, to quantify in your estimated blood loss, and that can be a huge problem. Um, time is, is so vitally important. Size uh, of your opening is so important. You're setting yourself up for disaster by making uh, a craniotomy that's a smaller approach, but that's where uh, your understanding of the anatomy preoperatively and, and of the view of different approaches uh, is going to give you success because it allows for that. Um, but uh, keeping the room warm, uh, paying very strict attention to blood loss, understanding that uh, an intraoperative rupture is very likely going to be life-ending, if not associated with significant compromise, uh, initiating uh, blood at the uh, time the incision is made, uh, just having a pediatric intensivist that is absolutely on top of uh, the child uh, second by second. And it's not to say that these things aren't done uh, with adults, but adults don't die quickly on the table. Um, and uh, the worst thing that can happen is have a giant aneurysm in a 10-day-old uh, a rupture uh, become uh, associated rapidly with a, a swollen brain, which then makes it uh, very, very difficult to create the proximal control without hurting the patient, just to trying to do that, um, trying to keep up with blood and then trying to uh, secure an aneurysm while they're doing chest compressions. Uh, and um, that makes these cases uh, uh, extraordinarily difficult. And there's only two ways these giant aneurysms can go in these young kids. They can either go perfectly or not. Uh, there's no in between. Uh, so I, I just think understanding that there, there are much more significant limitations uh, in operating on kids. And a lot of it has to do with timing, administration of blood, uh, and doing everything you can to avoid bleeding. Well, there are certainly uh, is uh, very much difficult in these this complex cases. Um, continuing with this topic line, um, what strategies do you consider on previously coiled aneurysms, on the previously treated uh, children with um, endovascular uh, roots? What did you consider about that? We've had both success and failure with coiling. Uh, usually our uh, vertebral aneurysms, uh, vertebral basal aneurysms will coil. Um, we've had some very good successes where coiling was a, a permanent uh, cure, if you will. Uh, we've had other aneurysms that have expanded and continued to grow despite the coiling. Uh, we found out the hard way uh, in trying to excise that segment um, that the coils are very difficult to remove, uh, that the coils have memory and will open up uh, as you open up the dome of the aneurysm and, and basically delivering uh, the coils from the aneurysm so you can excise, uh, trap and excise the aneurysm uh, is extraordinarily difficult. The first one of those I did was back in 1994, 1995 with Steve Giannata uh, and uh, really took uh, every bit of uh, uh, his expertise. Uh, you know, I was just an excited observer more than anything else, but uh, if it wasn't him, that child would have done very poorly. Uh, and uh, it's the type of thing you have to learn the hard way, I think. But uh, if you see an aneurysm expanding despite a prior coiling, that, that's something you really need to understand is that trapping uh, with the intent of removing those coils is gonna be very, very difficult, especially for posterior circulation aneurysms. Uh, 
we've had very good success with our basilar tip aneurysms. Uh, all of those uh, as uh, should be are, are coiled. And even when we see some of these start to grow and develop, uh, despite the presence of the coils, uh, we've now watched some kids for up to 12 years where initially it looked like the dome was getting bigger and then that stopped. Uh, so I think for the basilar aneurysm, the success rate for um, endovascular treatments is extraordinarily high. And I think that's the only way it should be done. Uh, for the cavernous aneurysms, I think that uh, um, <laughs> my experience of two, um, that the, the pipeline uh, has really worked quite well, whether it be one or multiple, as we did in our last kid, um, because the um, consideration of doing a, uh, uh, a significant bypass, basically a bypass originating at an endocide um, vessel when you open up Glasscox and expose the Petrus carotid, uh, and then opening up Pernetsky's ring and, and basically having an endocide uh, go just about at or below the level of the ophthalmic uh, before trapping that segment, um, that's an extraordinarily difficult endeavor in a small child or even a large kid. Uh, and so anything I can do to get away from that approach, um, I think is appropriate. As I've said, I've only done eight of those uh, in my career and four of those occluded, uh, but those four occlusions did not result in com compromise. Uh, so I think that uh, endovascular treatment for the cavernous uh, or partially cavernous uh, aneurysms is the best way to go. Okay, well, Dr. Levy, thank you for your answers. Um, on behalf of CN on the 2021 IWBNC, I'd like to thank you once again. This has been a wonderful lecture, and we are really grateful and honored for your participation in this virtual Congress. Thank you very much. I look forward to watching the other presenters. Well, you are more than welcome. For all the audience, keep in mind, this lecture will be available on our website starting next week. And in a few minutes, in the next room, we'll have Dr. Uwe Spetzger doing his lecture, Access Routes and Decision Algorithms for Removal of College Cysts. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned on the chat screen or check the program schedule on our website, cianclus.com. Thank you once again, Dr. Levy. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, have a great day. Okay, I'll see you soon. Of course. <laughs>